Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Lost of Time. You're joined by myself, Joshua Mallard, and fellow host... Howdy, y'all. My name is Han Hitchin. We're back with a new episode. For those that don't know, Lost to Time is a podcast where we explore underrepresented composers, artists, musicians, you know, creatives, and whatnot. In this case, we try to identify people whose music or work is lost to time or otherwise slept on, underrated, um, not given a fair shot, and particularly because of their background. At the end of the day, these are folks y'all should totally be checking out if you haven't heard them already. Yes, these are people that we want you to check out and people that we want to check out as well. That being said, if there's someone who you think that, you know, the world doesn't really know about, um, but has great work out there, um, please leave a comment, let us know. Uh, Many of the composers that we feature on here and the artists in general that we feature um, we do not know of. And especially if they're not a composer uh, or not an instrumentalist, it's even more likely that we don't know about them. So we appreciate your insight. In any case, we're back. We're no longer in <laughs> Orlando, Florida Thank at God. Universal Studios. Yeah. Last episode, for those that missed it, we were um, on a bit of a, a vacation. Now we're back at our home in our studio and our mic quality surely showcases that heck yeah no now y'all can hear us crystal clear yes now we're going to jump into this episode um before we do though please be sure to check out the new and latest camp content um just looking at the youtube page there's been plenty of new podcast episodes with so many familiar faces for those that were at campground 22 there's also some footage posted of some of the amazing performances there so that was a great time um and you can relive that a bit or experience it for the first time on youtube yeah totally and we were there we were fortunate enough to be there in person and some of those performances were all some of them all of them were pretty fantastic so go ahead and check them out yes now let's jump into this han who are we talking about today Today, we are going to be discussing Ulysses K., who was a composer from Tucson, Arizona in the 20th century. Yes, a 20th century composer. And I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is this is one of the most well-documented composers I've seen in this series. Um, You know, there's so much um, documentation about their work out there. And we're going to sort of point you to some different places you can find that. But let's dive in. Sure. So those who are unaware, Kay's output is really vast and diverse. And it includes a wide variety of music ranging from symphonies, operas, film scores, choral works, and a diverse array of chamber music for both solo, duo, concerto settings. He he wrote a lot. And yeah. it's, it's <laughs> really impressive when you go and look at his discography. He has a lot of awesome stuff going on. But just going back to the beginning, he was born on January 7th, 1917 in Tucson, Arizona, where he spent a good deal of his life. His father was a Texan cowboy and a barber, and his mother was from Louisiana. Um, both his parents enjoyed making music at home and at their churches. And his stepbrother was also a violinist and a saxophonist and his stepsister a pianist. So already we're kind of seeing this trend that we see a lot in a lot of our cases in each episode where this is a composer who grew up with a musical family. But and you may think, okay, that's the end of it. His immediate family were all musicians. That's pretty cool. But no, but wait, there's more, y'all. So his mother's was actually the niece of a jazz legend. You may have heard of him. Just King Oliver, you know, and initially his mother wanted um, Ulysses to learn trumpet with his uncle and instead his uncle encouraged him to learn piano to get a fundamental understanding of music before picking up any kind of instrument. Yeah, that's a great um, introduction to the music world. Um, Yes, King Oliver, many of you might know, is definitely a jazz legend. Um, that being said, I'm so impressed by Ulysses K and I would not minimize his own achievements by just, you know, I've seen some people literally just follow up his name of, oh, Ulysses K, the nephew of, or, or the, um, yeah, like nephew of King Oliver 
or you know yeah. something like that but ulysses k as we're going to get into is super accomplished it's actually wild that being said yes music in the family this is the um the beginnings that we see in a lot of these great composers and i think that's fantastic um i do remember a quote showing up of here of like um king oliver basically saying basically that like oh yeah don't 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 teach him i'm not going to teach him trumpet you get him piano lessons that will lay lay the foundation for rudiments um mm -hmm. i guess that 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 um ulysses k considered that very helpful as well there's like an anecdote of him saying you know i think this was a, a great move <laughs> yeah and that's really cool when you start your career as a musician so early on from someone who's not only family but also a very well-respected person in the community and they give you this one piece of advice and it carries on with you up throughout your successful career i mean that's just awesome that k had that yeah and um as we'll get into i guess right now is the influences i wonder if they come from this sort of like um this jazz background so um he began studying um piano with william a ferguson and it was his stepsister who would um basically watch over his practicing um but piano wasn't all that he did when he was 10 he ended up picking up the violin and then playing saxophone out to the saxophone at 12 and at some point he began composing and arranging music for a group that he formed with friends. This was a quintet. And an interesting collection of instruments, actually, it was saxophone, clarinet, trumpet, violin, and drums. <laughs> that violin Dang. made it in there, made the cut. <laughs> um, though, uh, at least we didn't see French horn, you know? Oh, yeah, thank God. We don't <laughs> need none of that in our lives. Um, and the influences... Um, are pretty interesting and i think stem maybe from the jazz background like duke ellington and benny goodman and it says that he was also involved in his high school glee club marching band and jazz band so he was very <laughs> he was very much an active music student even before going to college or anything like that so that was great that his school even had those um opportunities available to him yeah, and for those, you know, in the public school system, this might be something you can relate to a lot more today. Sometimes you read about composers and it's like, oh, when they were 12, they got private lessons at the Paris Conservatory. Um, so this is actually a lot more relatable for those maybe in the U.S. in public school who, you know, are going to go through that beginning band experience work their way up and then you know get a pulitzer prize oh absolutely at least in the u.s that's how a lot of uh composers kind of get their way is is through public school systems so shout out to all those band directors out there yeah that stuff's important um and we can see that getting musicality and uh, musical people from a young age can do a lot um if it's done in a positive way. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> don't force your kids into lessons. <laughs> Please don't do that. Anyways, I think this is really um, insightful. And we'll actually be pointing out some of the sources that we're using to find this information. Because, again, Kay's life is super well documented. And we're not even covering everything. Yeah. I mean, he has just so much influence under his belt and was fortunate to have a lot of access to a lot of different kind of performances, especially during the summers while he was in Tucson. Um, some of these included performances by a Mexican American ensemble led by euphonium player, Joseph DeLuca. Now, if that sound, if that name sounds familiar, it's because Luca was the band director at the university of Arizona, as well as a former student of John Philip Sousa himself. So that's pretty interesting. Um, additionally, Kay also attended some concerts that were by the Tucson Symphony Orchestra at the Temple of Music and the Carnegie Library. And he also got to hear some performances by some really influential soloists, including, um, ja I might not pronounce his name correctly, and I apologize in advance, Jasha Heifetz, a Russian-American violinist, and contralto Marian Anderson, who was a very important figure in the struggle of black artists overcoming racial prejudice during the mid 20th century in the U S. So I think that that would have been a really influential experience for a young K. Yeah. Lots of familiar names popping up. 
Um, I think it's always interesting. Uh, we we looked at, for example, like Julia Perry. I mean, we looked at George Walker just in the last episode, mm-hmm. and you see kind of the um, what would you call it, like the family tree, the pedigree of composers, the lineage. I guess. Yeah, yeah, lineage. I think is the word. Back. Um, you meet you you study with one person and it connects you way back all the way to like Beethoven or something. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of like an interesting case of Kay quickly starting to connect with bigger names. And this would only be sort of the start of that. Uh, though, I guess one thing that's really interesting to note is how small the world is generally. Um, mm-hmm. When you're sometimes in these more niche spaces, like if you're getting involved in classical music, you might find that you start seeing people <laughs> that you yeah. recognize around or it's a lot easier to come into contact with certain people than you might think. Yeah, especially nowadays with um, technologies, especially social media. I mean, there have been instances where Joshua would go off to a conference and meet a performer that I'm writing a piece for but haven't ever met in person and only communicated with via email or Facebook or whatever it might be. And I think that's a really interesting experience where you have people that you know from two totally different spaces, maybe one in person, one virtual, and they end up meeting in another thing. And you're just like, wow, that's it's one of those things where it's like, I didn't know these two people knew each other and now they do. And it's great. Yeah. One day we'll just do this all on a VR chat or something. <laughs> oh, God, we'll meet no. on <laughs> the metaverse. Yeah. I'll, y'all can enjoy the motion sickness. I, I'm good. Now, anyways, moving on. Um, so Kay later became a liberal arts student at the University of Arizona. So staying in Arizona for a bit. Um, and then he was encouraged to pursue, pursue music by William Grant Still. Oh, wow. I mean, that's not like a big name or anything. I'm being really sarcastic right now, by the way. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm right here with you. That's pretty cool. I wanted to see a bit about how this happened. Um, there's somewhere where he wrote um, that he studied piano with Julia Rebel um, and was introduced to the works of Bartok and other contemporary composers at the time. Um, and it was during this time at University of Arizona that William Grant Still visited um, or that he visited William Grant Still and that set him on the road to be a composer. Um, I read about this in the the Columbia University Library's um, very extensi- extensive um, work on cataloging and archiving um, various documents and information on William, um, <laughs> not on William Grant Still, on Ulysses K. I don't know, maybe they have some info on William Grant Still, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised at, you know, how much information is out there. And Ulysses K has such a massive, um, basically like <laughs> archive of information. And we'll share a link to this and discuss it a bit later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that was a little interesting quote. So he's now in university and getting exposed to a lot more and getting inspired to compose more. So moving further away from just performing more towards like, you know, oh, I want to be a composer. But I guess that's what you, you want to happen when you go to school to get inspired. Oh, absolutely. Especially early on in your undergrad. But it's never too late. Anyway, so following his undergrad, Kay enrolled at the Eastman School of Music to pursue his master's. And there he studied with Bernard Rogers and Howard Hansen. And Kay wrote during this time that through his music theory teacher, John L. Lowell's encouragement, um, he won a scholarship to the Eastman School of Music and ended up being able to study with Rogers and Hanson. And while at Eastman, um, he heard his first orchestral works performed publicly and found it to be an invaluable experience. And I think that's just awesome that he's able to have access to these things as a master's student. And these are some things that a lot of composers will have access to earlier on in their lives, depending on their background or maybe their upbringing but the fact that now Kay is finally having access to this and the education that he deserves is awesome yeah though it is an interesting topic i wonder like 
is it harder now for orchestras to to for young composers to get performances versus back then? I mean, it's such a different landscape back then, though, too. Like, you know, being a person of color. I mean, it's tough now, but <laughs> it was not good then either. Oh, heck um, no. But also just like the way the world works now with the internet and all that stuff. Um, it seems so hard to get, you know, rehearsal time and stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, we might as well assume it's the same back then getting large forces like orchestra at such a young age, getting performances and premieres like that is amazing. Yeah. In any case, it was at this time that his early works would be premiered um, at Eastman, and this would include Sinfonietta for orchestra, concerto for or- oboe and orchestra, and that one was performed by Robert Sprenkel. And he had a ballet premiered, Dance Kalinda. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing Kalinda that right. Kalinda or Kalinda, probably. And this was really cool to get a ballet performed, you know? I mean, I haven't even written a ballet, and I don't know many people who have. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work to put together a ballet because you have not only the music, you have the text. And Dance Kalinda was based on a story by Ridgely Torrance. And you also have, you know, to organize the performers, the staging, costume. There's just so many elements that go into ballets, operas, musicals. It's just, it's wild. Yeah, so he was really active um, at this time, which is great. Um, And he earned his master's in 1940. And he was, of course, meeting a lot of people at this time. And things kind of pick up from here. Um, following graduation from Eastman, he would win a scholarship to Tanglewood, and that was in the summer of 1941. And he would study with pretty big name here. That would be Paul Hindemith. I mean, that's not a big deal or anything. I mean, that's pretty great that he got, um, again, another great composer to kind of guide him and advise him. Um, and speaking of advisement, advisory advice that's the word um with hindeman's encouragement k won a scholarship to attend yale for the academic year from 1941 to 42 so that he could continue his work with hindemith see now we're picking up a little bit this is a great place for his academic career um a person of color in the 40s going from eastman to yale so that's really amazing and also studying with some big names you know I mean, yeah, that's really stellar, especially given the circumstances and the time period. I mean, that's just great that Kay had this opportunity. Yeah, I mean, this wouldn't even really happen today for the vast majority of people. Um, Now, there's actually a lot of story behind this. Um, There's a really cool quote here um, that Kay wrote. Kay, Kay writes that Hindemith insisted we write away from the piano. And we did various things in class. He would put a text on the board of about four or eight lines and say, okay, let's write a piece. 20 minutes later, he wanted to see it and he'd write one too. And that didn't mean a piece ready for performance or publication, but a first sketch. And nobody used a piano unless he'd play it over for the class. But it was just fantastic. So pretty cool sort of um, anecdote from Kay about his time studying with Hindemith and being in the classroom. I mean, that's unique insight. That's really cool. I mean, yeah, you don't see a lot of anecdotes that go into detail like that. I mean, that just puts me in the scenario. It makes me be like, wow, I can't wait to go to the next class. You know, it sounds really exciting. <laughs> I, we've been in this position before, though, like, you know, where you have a class where you compose no piano. There's a set time. And you walk out with, you know, a draft of a piece. Um, It can be really fun um, and definitely challenging being away from the piano, though it is interesting because during that time, it's not like they had computers and virtual instrument libraries and all that stuff. Um, They did not have the Sibelius or Finale MIDI playback that we all got, y'all. Yeah. So younger, younger kids, (laughs) younger folks. And I guess, you know, us, we're used to being away from the piano, but because we have so many options now to substitute. Back then, this had to be really, you know, even harder to just take away 
the piano. Though, I mean, he's an accomplished musician. I'm sure he did, you know, more than fine. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really cool, getting a text of four to eight lines. So I guess they would set the text just in 20 minutes. Yeah. And that class has a short class. It is. Or maybe it would be a class where maybe they would be inspired by the text and write a piece in recognition of it. I don't know. I mean, maybe it was open interpret. We don't know how open interpretation the interpretation was assigned by Hindemith, but we still think it's, you know, a cool environment. Yeah, we don't often hear about the classroom experience of big composers, you know, like, oh, what was Stravinsky doing in class? Or, well, he didn't go to a formal, like, <laughs> You, you get what I'm saying. I can't I'm sorry. Well, maybe his private lessons is what we would hear about. But yeah. Y'all get the idea. Um, but in any case, this was really cool insight. Um, but things would get derailed a bit after his time at Yale um, because now we're looking at 1941 to 42, and you know something big happens in the world around this time. How about we get into that? So it has the word world in the name. Um, It's the Second World War. So after his studies in Yale during World War II, Kay served in the U.S. Navy. So already here we are having a composer who is trying to stay active, not just during a world war, but while actively serving in one of the branches of the military during the Second World War. Um, And that's pretty intense, if you ask me. Um, But later on, when... Regarding this experience, he wrote, I enlisted in the Navy, auditioning on my long-since-neglected alto saxophone, and was assigned to a band stationed at Consett Point, Rhode Island. In the Navy band, I learned flute and piccolo, played piano in the dance orchestra, did much arranging, and some composing. So here we are. He's not just staying active as a saxophonist, but he's also picking up other instruments and still composing and arranging during this time. I mean, how wild is that? Yeah, I mean, this was a time where a lot of composers' output was just outright stopped. Um, Mm -hmm. And huge interruptions in biographies, stuff like that. Um, So I think it's amazing that, you know, he's still active during this time. And from the writings I've seen, it might not even be something that, like, you know, is that negative of an experience. Though, I'd say learning piccolo is a pretty negative experience. Oh my god, Josh. (laughs) Would you rather enlist in the Navy or learn to play the piccolo? Josh says enlist in the Navy. Well, I felt like I enlisted in the Navy when I learned piccolo, so... You know, that's true. They're (laughs) one in the same experience. In any case, I think this is really, um, really great insight into this period of time. Um, And actually, he would still compose during this period, and he has a prominent composition called of new horizons and this is for concert bands so super interesting you know joining the navy joining the navy band and then getting a concert band composition that's really cool oh yeah and i don't know if you mentioned this josh but the piece was commissioned by thor johnson and ended up being performed by the new york philharmonic so that's pretty great and it was premiered in 1944 so i mean who else what other ensemble would you want to premiere your band piece i (laughs) mean (laughs) it is really interesting having the new york philharmonic perform your concert band piece yeah i mean it was probably i don't know maybe it was without all the strings i wasn't able to find a recording of it but i imagine it was just the new york phil senza strings yeah i mean the concert band history is super interesting in the u.s too um that's something you know worth digging into as well seeing how many concert bands were around that were reading music performing stuff like that Mm -hmm. um so maybe that's like a little history thing to dig into Mm -hmm. um but you know he didn't stop here um upon being discharged from the navy uh he would receive a fellowship the alice m ditson fellowship um and this would allow him to do more work at columbia university where he would study with another big name otto looning I mean, that's pretty awesome, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, this is coming right out of a literal world war, and you're back in there, you know, studying with another big name, going to another great university, um, or prestigious university, um, and then ni- that's 1946 to 1947. And he does have more writings about this. Again, the Columbia University, which probably, I wonder, because he went there, is this why they have so much 
archival information on him. Um, he, he wrote um, that after the war, I came to New York, enrolled at Columbia, attended auto learning seminar sporadically, and composed as much as possible. A unique experience at this time was writing and conducting music for The Quiet One. This sensitive film, written and produced by people with a true concern for music, was a fine opportunity for me as a composer. So we kind of stumbled right into it, but okay, now he's doing film music, and he's at Columbia University, and he's studying with a big-name composer. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty awesome. I mean, you go from serving in the Navy playing flute, piccolo, saxophone, piano, doing all the stuff, having a concert band premiere by the New York Phil. Yeah, no big deal. But now here he is at Columbia um, about to do his first film score. I mean, that's just really, really awesome. Yeah, this is one of those composers where it's really um, inspiring to read the bio, but also you're like, wow, how did so much happen? Mm -hmm. Um, This film score is something we'll talk about a little bit later, but it is really nice. (laughs) Yeah. And there's audio for it, so we'll point you in that direction and talk about it a little bit later. But I thought this was great, and it's not the end. I mean, he was so busy during this time that even more is happening while he's studying at Columbia. Yeah, he's not even taking his foot off the gas just yet. So something that's a pretty big deal, in my opinion. Um, Kay was actually the first African-American to receive the Prix de Rome And not only did he receive it the first time in 1946, he also received it again in 1949. And this allowed him to study in Italy, um, both in 1946 and 1949, and the later trip he was able to take his wife with him. Wholesome. Very wholesome. (laughs) Yeah, so um, this was really cool. I mean, this is another case of a composer getting to leave the U.S., Um, go and study. I think this is really, you know, amazing. Yeah. At this point, we'll sort of jump around a bit. Um, You know, he lives all the way till the 90s. So there's actually quite a lot, (laughs) like a ton of documented stuff on his biography alone. So we're going to jump around a bit to a bit of, uh, you know, a mix of the what happened after the pre de Rome and some other noteworthy things. Um, so during the summers, once he was back in the U S he was a resident at the auto festival and this was in Saratoga Springs, New York. He'd do this six times. Um, so this is really cool. Um, a residency. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty awesome. I would say one residency is already pretty great, but six, that's just, they love him. Yeah. And he kept writing during this time, um, throughout this period, there's um, The Rope, which was a piece for a solo dancer and piano. I mean, solo dancer and piano, how often do you see that? No, and those pieces are always pretty cool, if you ask me. Yep, and he also had another orchestra piece, Concerto for Orchestra. Now, some other really cool things happened in the 50s alone, one of them being that Kay was part of a delegation of composers sent to the Soviet Union, and this was part of like the U.S.'s um sort of like exchange agreement Mm -hmm. um and so like an artistic exchange a cultural exchange educational and he went there with roy harris peter menon and roger sessions so really cool group i mean this is um i guess like a cultural representation of some of the music being produced in the u.s during the time yeah and i mean that's just really a unique experience to be selected amongst other composers as hey you represent the you represent our country in this case the u.s go ahead on to the ussr and represent us please i mean that's just really interesting and a unique experience yeah unique is a way to put it um this is very interesting and obviously during some pretty um (laughs) rough times as far as like the international relations and stuff um so there's actually quite a bit of documentation of what this experience was like for Kay, um, for the composers over there. And then also um, there is a letter that President Dwight D. Eisenhower wrote um, to Kay and the composers in the delegation. And one of the quotes from it says, um, represent us all in bringing assurance to the people you meet that the United States is a friendly nation 
and one dedicated to the search for world peace and to the promotion of the well-being and security of the community of nations. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, but this was like a letter to them um, kind of trying to say like, oh, they represent, you know, the U.S. kind of thing. Um, but of course, this is tied into a lot of the international uh, politics going on. So I think it's interesting to see this happen, you know, kind of like, whoa, this happened. Yeah, it was definitely a really interesting situation. And during the trip, which was a month long, Kay kept a diary detailing his daily events. And the group took many trips across the USSR, including visiting Moscow, um, Leningrad, Tbilis, and Kiev. Um, and they were listed in his diary, which he kept from 1949 to 1990. So this diary wasn't just a thing that he's like, oh, I'm going to go to the USSR. I'm going to start a diary. No, he started it about 10 years prior and kept it up until the tail end of his life. Yeah. And the Columbia University Libraries has um, like a lot of entries from this diary. It's like they, they have it archived and everything. And you can actually see pictures of this trip um, to Moscow and stuff, which is really cool. And even more anecdotes on what this experience was like. And, you know, um, all of that. So definitely check that out. We'll include it in the show notes. Yes. Um, not only did they spend a lot of time traveling across USSR, but the composers group also um, ended up meeting with Soviet composers, listening to their works. And they just overall spent a lot of time with them. Um, and as quoted, they were being wined and dined. So it was definitely a fun experience for them. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I guess it was free food. Hey, I, I like anything with free food. Yeah, so this is just kind of a unique experience. I think um, I've read about this happening before as well, um, but that'll be something I can dig into later on. Um, one of the things that Kay realized, too, was that there was um, an interest in jazz among Russian composers. I thought this was interesting because... Um, well, actually, Kay brought recordings of like Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, uh, Louis Armstrong, and many more. And I remember in a Miles Davis interview, um, he noted how Europeans love jazz, apparently. And I guess it extends to Russia as well, um, wanting to hear this American art form. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting perspective to have of because as. Um, people who grew up in the U.S., we have our perspective of jazz, but then to see someone else from another country having their opinion and perspective on jazz, I think is really interesting, and it's cool to see that there's an interest. Yeah, and um, I mean, that extends to the classical music as well. It says that there is um, a concert on October 15th in which the Moscow State Radio Orchestra um, presented a, a concert of music by the visiting composers in the Tchaikovsky Hall, and this was sold out. On this program was Peter Menon's Sixth Symphony, Roy Harris's Fifth Symphony, Symphony, <laughs> Roger Sessions' um, Suite from Black Maskers, and K's of New Horizons, which was the concert band piece of New Horizons. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, this is just a pretty unique experience. Um, so I think it's amazing that it's documented um, and it says that um, upon his return, Hi-Fi Review published Kay's account of the trip entitled 30 Days in Musical Russia. So maybe someone can go and dig into that. Um, but again, we found this out through the Columbia University Libraries. Um, really cool resource and source of information on Kay. We're not sponsored by the Columbia University Libraries, but we would like to thank the Columbia University Libraries. Yes, um, it is awesome. I mean, <laughs> in academic interest, it's important to know our sources, but also we like to say this because these are things that are available out there, you know, so you can sort of look up this information and learn and proliferate, you know, the knowledge that you learn and, um, you know, uplift Kay's music even more. Absolutely. And you don't have to just learn about Kay's music. You can learn about anyone's music. Yeah. And on that note, let's go back to the film score, the quiet one. 
So this is actually available on YouTube, and we include we'll include some links to that in the show notes. Um, but you can also read about it on the Columbia University Libraries um, website. So this was like a, a fifty minute film score, um, and also a suite was created for it. So I think that was really cool. If you hear it, I really like it. I mean, wonderful orchestration. Um, a lot of the orchestral film scores back then were, you know, really good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And just for a bit of timeline here, the film was, I'm not sure when the film was released, but the score was written in 1948. So this is a mid 20th century era uh, film uh, and music to go with it. I mean, I think that's just something else that's noteworthy that it's definitely going to be an early influence of future film scores to come yeah i mean this was like a, a big time for um developing the film sound mm-hmm. so i think this is really indicative of the time and if you're into that you know golden age sound whatnot you're going to like this one um it's you know not super um not super contemporary sounding so a lot of romantic influence um i think you know it's it's you know, a crowd pleaser. I think a lot of you will like it. Absolutely. So I think it's amazing at all that the links or the audio is available to listen to. So definitely check that out if you get the chance. The last bit we want to touch on is, of course, his teaching career. So a lot of his later life was involved in teaching. Um, So Han, how about you tell us about that? Absolutely. So as Josh mentioned, um, teaching took up a lot of time in his later life, and he joined the faculty of the Herbert H. Lemon College of the City University of New York in 1968. Sorry, that's quite a long name for a college, but that's pretty great that he joined the faculty there in the 60s. And there he was a professor of music who taught theory, composition, and he did this on a full-time basis. So, of course, this is already going to be taking up a lot of his time. Um, Later in, or sorry, earlier in 65, he left his gig at BMI, which by the way, he worked at BMI for about 10 years in the 50s and 60s. Um, And when he left BMI, he ended up taking a professorship at the Boston University from 1966 to 67, and then a visiting professorship at the University of California, Los Angeles. So UCLA is, it's more better known. So here he was hopping between different well-known universities and um, that notably are geographically quite far apart from each other in the U.S. I mean, you have one in New York, one in Boston, one in Los Angeles, California. I mean, I think that's a lot of ground to cover, but it's also really influential places um, for music, new music and I think it's really great that he was able to be a mentor professor role at these places yeah and actually it seems like he really enjoyed teaching there's an interview in the new york post um dated june 3rd 1968 and Kay talks a little bit about you know the experience of teaching and his motivations and Kay writes teaching is right in the thick of it and the young people are very vitally concerned and interested he also noted that he was happy that he had waited until later um, in his career to start teaching, um, it gave him security in his work as a composer, which I think is, you know, something that's not really talked about much, you know, um, especially because you can really go straight from school right into teaching. Um, and so the, the whole career path line varies a lot from composer to composer. Um, mm-hmm. Though I, I think he would have been fine either way, because clearly He was doing great while in school. Oh, absolutely. And nowadays it's very difficult for a lot of very well, well well-established composers even who are coming out of school to get teaching gigs just because, you know, the market is super competitive right now, unfortunately. Yeah, the the whole landscape is definitely changing. Um, (laughs) That's that's not lost to time. That's (laughs) this time right now. Um, but you know, we're preaching to the choir. Um, but in any case, uh, Ulysses K was teaching full time and he was still active. He was composing, conducting, he was being an adjudicator, a consultant, 
doing guest lectures and actually you can see really wonderful images of his travels and various activities on the Columbia University uh, library website. So I think this is, you know, stuff you don't really get to see a lot of. Um, and especially maybe during this time period, you know, nowadays we have smartphones. I can, <laughs> I can whip out my phone, take a picture at any moment. Um, so it's r a rare opportunity to kind of see this stuff documented back then. Absolutely. But now we can jump into the music. How about you kick this off, Han? Absolutely. So the first piece that we have the privilege of talking about today is a work called Chariots and Orchestral Rhapsody. And before we give our thoughts, um, this is a piece that you can check out on YouTube. There's a performance that is actually the world premiere performance of this piece um, with Ulysses K. himself conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra. And this recording is from August 1979. So while it's definitely an older recording, it still sounds fantastic. And we really enjoyed listening to this performance. Um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the recording, too. Yeah. I love the small, like, studio orchestra kind of sound in the, the specific recording we heard. Mm -hmm. um, the, way, the way he writes, um, I know this isn't the most academic <laughs> opinion, but it, because of the small orchestra sound, and the style in which he writes, which has, it has these like, you know, it's a good combination of like dissonances that sound fresh, but also it has like more sort of romantic influenced um, harmonies, stuff like that. And you kind of have this fluid um, sort of like motion between the two. And it sounded like I was like, you know, listening to Joe Hizaishi or something for a little bit. But I don't want to mm -hmm. make a direct comparison, of course. Um, this really stands on its own as being, you know, unique. And it's more just the aesthetic of the recording put me in that, that space. Absolutely. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know the time frame of when those films were coming out, but maybe this was an influence. No, no. This no? Is, well, maybe an influence for sure. But Yeah, you that's know. what I meant. <laughs> like an influence <laughs> this uh, is, for those composers yeah, yeah. or for that kind of style. Um, another thing that I thought when I was listening to this, to the piece itself, is it sounded very independent of what other orchestral composers were doing at this time. Um, there's definitely kind of some film score influence in there, which makes sense, given that, you know, Ulysses K also wrote film music. But not only did he have um, his trademark neoclassical elements in there, you know, he had the very um, flourishing melodies and the way he orchestrates the content and the way he develops the melodies i mean the way he's doing everything is very um by the book of what his music is like um he's very much um written in a lot of neoclassical styles but he also mixes a lot of dissonance and compelling harmonies on top of that and i think that is what made this piece really interesting for me personally yeah and there's actually a lot you can dig into on again the columbia university archives the library you can see the sketches and it's really interesting how he's sort of like laid out um the music in the sketches um kind of spatial spatially laid out um not actually super super detailed all the time but then you can also see some of the actual score and it's actually really cool to see um and i i love that this is accessible uh, they also note on here that he was inspired by the spiritual swing low sweet chariot. So that's probably wow. where the name comes from. Um, and I think it's really cool just to read into that. Yeah, I think so too. And we're very glad and fortunate to have access to this information. Yeah, definitely dig into this. Um, it's, uh, it's a symphony orchestra piece, but I, that recording is really interesting and in the sound like those small orchestra kind of sound. Yeah, absolutely. But one other thing just for me to chime in on what I liked about this was I love the sort of patient development of this piece. You get sort of like the opening and the other sort of um, middle sections where you have like the really slow, um, they start off like dissonant and stuff of like s soloistic instruments kind of just, but just playing kind of plain tones you know, a really um, non-ornamented sense of vibrato kind of sound. Um, and you get kind of this like really cold texture to it. 
and then it kind of just transforms into a warmer, more consonant, um, flourishing kind of passage, which I think is really um, impressive pacing of the material, but also really great kind of change of, <laughs> I was going to say change of pace, but a texture change that's really interesting. Yeah, it's really refreshing. Yeah, it's nice to isolate some of the um, great colors in the orchestra. Yeah. Next piece we want to talk about is one for string orchestra, actually, called Six Dances for String Orchestra. This one was composed in 1954, and there's a recording that we'll link that's performed by the Westphalian Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Paul Freeman. So this is actually a really interesting one, um, definitely in like the neoclassical vein. The alternate title for this is actually American Dances. Huh. So I think this is, um, you know, one, if you're, if you're really a fan of classical era music or, um, you know, anything like that, you're going to enjoy this one. Baroque classical type sound to it for sure. That being said, though, there's some really nice modern touches to this, like some fresh um, harmonic changes put into here that you might really enjoy. So you kind of get like an update to the sound almost. So I think this is one that, you know, plenty of you will really enjoy. And you should definitely listen to um, just to sort of like, you know, hear the big difference in sound between this one and the other Ulysses K pieces that we mentioned. Yeah, you can definitely hear um, a lot of the neoclassical influence, as Josh mentioned, that's in a lot of his other pieces in this piece. And I think this is a kind of a, what's it called? A cornerstone. That's the word. That's This is a cornerstone piece of his neoclassical work. So I totally recommend checking it out if you would like to listen to some pretty charming string orchestra music. Yeah, we've jumped quite a bit time-wise, too. This is in the 50s, the other one's in the 70s. So kind of really interesting how big of a difference the change in sound was. Um, that being said, you know, this one is a different source of inspiration, you know, so um, definitely check them both out. Now to finish this out, we do want to talk about one of the operas by Ulysses K, and that's Frederick Douglass. Now, Ulysses K wrote five operas, which is uh, actually a very serious undertaking. That's a lot of operas. Pretty awesome, if you ask me. Now, how about you tell us a little bit about this one, Han? Absolutely. So, kind of backing up a little bit, in 1978, it was announced that both K and librettist Donald Dore received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts to work on an opera together. And so, Frederick Douglass was the result of that endowment um and they began working on it in 1979 and completed it six years later in 1985 so this opera as we were mentioning earlier um there's a lot to put into it um but six years just to write the actual piece now you may think okay great 1985 the piece is ready to go no it's gonna take another six years before the opera is premiered in 1991 at the Newark Symphony Hall by the New Jersey State Opera, and that production was directed by Louis Johnson and designed by Salvador Tallarino. Tallarino. Apologies if I mispronounce that. Um, but a little bit about the story, as we mentioned, it's a opera the where the libretto is written by Donald Dore. It's in three acts, and it is a semi-fictionalized story accounting the final years of the life of, as the title suggests, Frederick Douglass after his marriage to his second wife, Helen Pitts Douglas. Yes, and actually this is one piece where we haven't yet found a recording. So we're very interested if someone, you know, can dig that up. Um, I think this is something we need to hear, you know? Absolutely. Or if you were maybe part of a production or saw a production or know of one, I mean it would be absolutely awesome if a recording was made available to the public. You know, it, granted, all the right copyright and everything is there and all the permissions are there to do so. That would be a great thing for everyone to have access to, we think. Yes, but this is, you know, one of five of his operas. So it's definitely one we wanted to mention. Um, and we want to encourage you to do a little bit of, you know, searching, um, look into uh, the music of Ulysses K and see what you can find and share it with your friends, you know? Absolutely. And not just Ulysses K, but other awesome composers who are 
writing operas and other interesting works about um, subjects such as, you know, important people in history, such as Frederick Douglass, or other time periods that you find important or impressionable to you. Yes, opera is a unique art form. And I mean, it's really changing today, even though I've, I've seen, I saw my first opera live just last year. And it amazes me how people perform them. Like, it's such a huge undertaking, it looks like. Oh, yeah. Operas are one of those things where it's super impressive to see them live, but it's it's also impressive to see them virtually when you can. Um, so totally recommend checking out operas. Don't sleep on operas. Yeah. And with that said, we'd like to thank you all for tuning in to this new episode. Um, we're glad to be back. You know, <laughs> we're not on vacation this time. So we're glad to be in a more controlled environment and to be able to, you know, give you guys a great episode. Um, so please uh, leave a comment on, you know, what composers you think we should check out. Not just composers, though, any instrumentalists. I don't know. Maybe we should expand any artists, you know, poets, things like that. Just let us know anyone in the creative spaces um, who might be a great fit for this episode and that the world needs to know about. Absolutely. It could be someone that maybe we mentioned in this episode or another episode that you think, hey, you know what, Marian Anderson, why don't you do a whole episode on her? Or someone that maybe we have in touch that you know in the back of your mind, like, hey, I would love to see an episode on this person and we would love to at the very least learn about that person. And that's kind of the whole mission behind our podcast. Wouldn't you say so, Josh? Yes, for sure. And with that said, this episode is brought to you by the Contemporary Art Music Project. Please go ahead and click the um, subscribe button if you're seeing this on YouTube. Leave some comments and check out the channel. There's more interesting interviews, podcasts, and even performance clips now that you can check out on the YouTube channel. And of course, the website has a lot of the big activities archived. So. We hope you guys can look into that and that you're enjoying the episodes. Yes, whether you're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever it is you may be, we hope that you're enjoying us. (laughs) Yep, and with that said, we'll see you next time. Have a great one, y'all.